Uh, thanks very much, Laura. All right, I'm now just going to do this kind of clunky bit that involves you sharing a screen and hope for the best. Well, this isn't the best start. <laughs> There we go, hopefully. How's that? That's it, Alison, that's great. There we go. All right. Slight hiccup to begin with, but we'll go with it. Um, all right, I'm just going to pop this up. Um, morning, everyone. So, as Laura said, my name's Alison Burns. I'm the principal teacher in the D-Law over at St Ninian's Primary School in Knightswood. I hope you're all well and I hope that you enjoyed your bank holiday weekend as best you could um, and welcome back to this week's Coffee Break webinars. I've been asked today to deliver a session just given a wee brief overview of some of the accessibility features that are built into the deployed iPads. I'm not going to be covering all of them um, but hopefully I'll give you enough information that you can at your own pace and maybe at your own time later on you can explore them a wee bit more and consider what benefits they have to not only just the children that you teach, but also for yourself and uh, the staff that you work with. I'm going to warn you, I've never done anything like this before, so I'm going to apologise in advance if things are a wee bit uh, clunky. But, you know, we're all learning here, so I'm crossing my fingers that the, uh, the technology doesn't let me down. So as I said, we're going to start um, just having a wee look through the features, and then if you can have a wee consideration throughout it as to what uses it could have for you in the classroom, uh, that's really what we're aiming to get out of for today's session. So to start with, in order to access uh, the features we're going to be looking at, we're going to go into our settings menu on our iPad. Now, the accessibility tab is down on the left hand side. If you're operating on an earlier um, system, an earlier iOS, you might find it in the general tab. But if you're up to date, then the accessibility tab is there by itself. And all I'm going to do is have a little look through some of the features within these. Some are a little bit um, more relevant than others to me. I'm coming at this very much from a um, mainstream perspective. And I know later on some of the, the webinars that are later on this week are going to be looking at them in a wee bit more detail. So the aim of today is just very much to give you a brief overview of some of these features. I'm going to start just at the top and I'm going to work my way down some of them. Um, having a look, first of all, with voiceover, you'll see my voiceover is currently off. VoiceOver is designed to support people with a visual impairment. It's gesture based, so you can do lots of different things with your iPad using your fingers. And it's designed that you can operate your iPad even without seeing your screen. With the VoiceOver enabled, you'll hear a description of everything that's happening in your screen from, you know, what level your battery is at to which app your finger's currently resting on. Um, you can see underneath the voiceover that there is a bullet pointed list of all the different um, gestures that you can do to activate the features. I have not used this uh, in the classroom. I don't have a, a need for it at the moment. Uh, there has been the odd occasion where a child has activated it. Accidentally or not, you can decide for yourself. Uh, so if the iPads suddenly start talking to you in your classroom, chances are they've probably activated the voiceover. Um, but I'm not going to um, have a look at that today. Zoom is next up. Uh, Zoom's quite a handy me tool. I quite like it. Uh, again, there's the bullet pointed list. This is what I really like about the Apple devices is underneath uh, the accessibility features, there's always a little set of instructions that sort of explain the feature a wee bit or tell you how to operate it. The Zoom magnifies. So if you do a double tap three fingers on your screen, if it's, activified, it, if it's activated, rather, it brings you up this little uh, movable screen, which will allow you to enlarge text that's on your screen. If you go over any of the buttons, the buttons will remain active. And if you do a little double tap on the button at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that uh, you get a number of uh, little menus. I'm just going to move that up there just so that the menu comes underneath, hopefully. There we go. So you can see that using the little slidey bar at the bottom, I can increase or decrease that zoom. I can also, if I wanted to, put a filter over it. I know that's beneficial for some children. I can also do a little resize of that lens so I can make it bigger or smaller, depending on what my, my needs are. And again, 
just doing a little tap. These things never work when you want them to. Zoom out will allow that to disappear. Now I leave that zoom on all of the time, saying it doesn't really do anything until I do a double tap with my three fingers to activate it. Moving on to the magnifier. The magnifier is next. The magnifier allows me to use the inbuilt camera to magnify text around me. So whereas the zoom focuses very much on what is on your page, the magnifier allows you to, to use it to magnify text that could be on something on your table in front of you. So what I'm going to do is as, you know, triple click the home button to start magnifier. So if it's turned on, three clicks of your home button will open up something quite similar. You can see my lovely wallpaper. If I move my iPad, I've got a, an Apple Pencil box right in front of me. And you'll see here, if any of you have got an Apple Pencil box, you'll know the text um, is very, very small in the back of it. Using the sliding bar, I can zoom in. And actually, I think it's much more powerful than using the camera itself. By pressing the, the button, the button that you would usually associate with taking a photograph, it will hold that image so that I can then move my iPad around and it doesn't change the image, but it will not save it. It just holds the image there for you to use it. So again, I've used that um, in the classroom. Not only have I used it for text on the screen, or on the table rather, but I've also used it in things like science lessons where we've been looking up close at lovely bugs and things like that, um, or rather the children have, because I don't like to go near things like that. The, the set of the accessibility features I use most often is the display and text size section. Uh, this has got quite a lot of handy little features in it that I have used with children with specific literacy difficulties uh, in, my, in my class. Bold text is fairly self-explanatory. It just enhances the text a little bit to make it a little bit easier to read. Again, large text may be suitable for some children, even some staff. Even yourself, you might want to make uh, your text a little bit bigger so that you can read it. And it's done just by sliding that bar up and down. Button shapes. Um, I'm not too sure really what I would use button shapes for. If you turn them on, you'll see up at the top, the accessibility button right at the top suddenly gets a line underneath it. And I think it's something to do with perhaps a third party app that allows that to... Um, to be read. Again, not really something I've used or have a tremendous amount of experience with. I've used the on-off labels with certain children that, as you know, when you turn a button on or off, it goes green or grey. With the on-off labels, it tends to show a one or a zero in addition to that. And, you know, it's useful for children that perhaps may have difficulty seeing certain colours or distinguishing between um, colours. The reduced transparency, I've got it off at the moment. Um, if I show you one of my folders, you'll see that when I open up my folder, these are all of my Apple apps. You can see in the background, all the other apps that are on my screen are still visible. They're blurred out, but they are still visible. If I turn on the reduced transparency, if I now go back into that folder, you'll see the background has completely blacked that out. I quite like it like that. That's how I usually have it on. I reduce that transparency and leave it like that. It's handy, I think, for children that maybe have some focus issues or maybe some sensory difficulties that maybe too much on the screen can be quite tricky for them. So I like to leave that on just, just for me, but also some of the children in my class have really liked just getting rid of the, the sort of fuss in the background a little bit. Again, moving down, we've got the increased contrast. Uh, which again, that the difference between the grey and the white on your screen is quite subtle. If you think that needs to be a little bit more prominent for some children, you can turn that on. Then, of course, we've got the smart and the classic invert a wee bit further down. Um, if I turn on the classic invert, you'll see it will invert all colours on your screen. If I turn on the smart invert, you'll see the icons on the left hand side will remain as they are. So it doesn't necessarily affect some images or some media that you will see on your screen. However, Classic Invert will change everything. So again, it really depends very much on what the needs are um, of the people in front of you. Now, the other thing that people are finding quite handy is the colour filters. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I know this is going to be explored in more detail in one of the webinars later this week. But if you have someone in your class that perhaps would benefit from having a colour filter, the options are there for you. 
I'm going to leave that um, for one of the other webinars, but you are welcome to go in and have a little look and a play about with that yourself to see uh, whether you think it might be something that's quite beneficial for you. There's quite a lot in this, um, this display and text size, and I think it's quite useful for not just the children in your class that might have a specific need, but for all children to be able to see what is available to them and maybe adapt their iPad to suit to suit them, personalise that, that little bit more. Uh, moving on to motion. I think an awful lot of the features that are discussed in motion um, have sort of been disabled on the Glasgow iPads. So uh, any kind of fancy effects and things that might happen, I'm sad to say, don't, don't always appear on a Glasgow iPad. But if uh, that was an issue for certain children, then you have the option to turn that on and you can uh, reduce sort of special effects and slight transitions and things like that to make them a little bit more seamless and a little bit um, less difficult for them to access. The other part, I've said that I, I spend quite a lot of time with the display and text size. The other part um, that I really have explored a lot with children is the spoken context section. The speak selection I have on now, if I switch to here, I've just got a, a section of the BFG uh, on my screen. It's just in the Pages document. I have a, a boy in my class that really struggles with reading, very much refuses uh, to engage with many texts. He finds it very, very difficult. So this tool for him suddenly was a bit of a life changer. When you double click on a word, you'll see up above it, we now have this option to speak. Now, I don't think uh, sounds come over uh, over this sort of broadcast, but when I hit the word speak, it will speak the word aloud and it will highlight it as it speaks. So if I highlight, say, a sentence, again, I have this speak option, which will allow the iPad to text their child. Now, if I go back to my features, you'll see that I have the option to highlight the content. So if I want it to highlight it word for word as it reads, it will do that for me. I can change the speed of the speaking rate so I can make it faster. I can make it slower depending on the child. And I can change the voice. So at the moment, I'm in English. And I've got it listed under the Siri mail, but there are a wide array of voices and accents in there that you can choose from, all available um, to download and are all there for you, ready to go. So I've used that quite a lot. In addition to the speak um, with the child I was talking about that I use quite a lot, is I also use the dictation tool. And I'm not sure if um, many of you have used it, but down next to your space bar, there is a, a microphone. Very handy if a child is maybe doing a piece of writing and doesn't know how to spell a word or write a word. Uh, we also, you know, we have the dictionary option, of course, but a simple press of that button will allow the child to speak a word and the, the iPad will write it for them. The difficulties I've come up against with that are very much, you know, how the child speaks. Sometimes there can be a bit of issues with the, the sort of West of Scotland dialect, but I have to say I found it fairly accurate and fairly um, robust in using it. I use it quite a lot, uh, particularly in apps like Seesaw or, or Shobi. I use it quite a lot when I'm giving um, feedback. Instead of sitting typing out sentences after sentences after sentences, I will press that and just read it. I've also, maybe should admit this, used it quite a lot when writing report cards. So instead of again sitting typing that paragraph out, press that button, read uh, what it is, or speak rather, what it is that you want to say. And then it's just a simple kind of going back and editing a wee sentence here, a wee word here, a wee bit of punctuation here, there and everywhere. Um, it's quite a handy little tool. So when a child is having difficulty accessing text, the reading tool where it will speak the text for them, but also the dictation tool where it will type for them um, are both very, very handy and allow the children to produce pieces of work that, you know, previously I wouldn't, wouldn't have... Um, wouldn't have received from them. So there's quite a lot within the spoken content that I found really quite handy working with them. We also have the audio descriptions. Now the audio descriptions come into play with um, third parties. You'll know yourself if you've ever seen it on your televisions where you have a, an audio, um, a 
account of what's happening on the screen for people who are unable to see the screen. Similar thing, but it does it does mean that the the person who is providing the video must have provided the audio description with it. So it doesn't always um, doesn't always come on when you're watching a video. But that is there. But again, not really something I've I've used in the classroom. So that's sort of all of the the, the vision ones, and they are certainly the, the section of the iPad I have used most often um, with the class. Moving into the, the next section, which is your physical motor, this is very much designed for sort of external equipment um, to be used. The assistive touch, I know this is one that's going to get looked at in a little bit more detail later on this week. Um, the assistive touch takes uh, the home button and puts it as a physical button on your screen that can be manipulated and moved around. Again, not something I've used with children, but it is something I used when I dropped my iPhone and it broke and my, my home button wasn't working. I um, was recommended to me to turn on the assistive touch, which allowed me to access a wide array of little features. Now, these can all be customised within this menu so that instead of having to use certain um, clips on the screen or certain buttons on the screen, it's all accessible through this one little menu that appears with your assistive touch. But again, I'm not going to go into that in too much detail because I know it's getting covered later on this week. But it is there and all of the, the customisation options are in there for you that if you want to go in and have a little look, uh, you can do. Now, the switch control and the voice control um, are both things that I'm not going to look at because they are very much, um, I think, for more specialist establishments. The only element of the home button which I think is potentially useful is the click speed. If you were doing this with children, there might be some children that have difficulty uh, double clicking or triple clicking the home button and you can slow that down uh, to allow it a little bit easier for them, make it a wee bit easier for them. I think, um, yeah, the keyboards are really more if you're adding on an external um, device and all of the hearing elements are really for um, if you wanted to maybe attach a Bluetooth device that would enable um, the sounds of the iPad to be enhanced final section down at the bottom is the guided access. Excuse me, I'm just having my notifications pop up. I've got to turn them off. Um, the guided access, again, is something that's going to be looked at in one of the later webinars. So if it's something that you think might, you might be interested in, it's well worth tuning into that later on this week. The guided access works in a kind of similar way to the Apple Classroom and it allows you to sort of lock into an app. The slight difference would be instead of the app being open to them, you can actually take out certain parts of the screen um, with the guided access and a, a limit of time on it. And you can set a passcode, which would be different from the passcode that unlocks the iPad. So the teacher sort of has very much the control over that. Um, but I said, I don't want to do, I don't want to steal other people's thunder by dwelling into some of these things a little bit much. So just to kind of recap on a few of them, I think the things that I found within the mainstream setting definitely the most beneficial are your text size options where you can invert your colours and um, increase your text sizes. That's really been beneficial to certain children, particularly some of the younger children as well that like the bigger font. But for me, I have to say the one that I use personally most of all, as well as with the children, has been the spoken content section. The, the ability for a child to, to speak and listen to their text without necessarily having to put pen to paper really has opened up literacy for some children that I work with. But I think um, that's sort of the main features I would say that I would that I have been using. So it's been a very, very quick kind of run through of some of these features and I hope that you found it uh, and I hope that you've found something in there that's perhaps made the iPad a little bit easier to access for yourself, but also for the children that you, you teach. As I've said before, some of these features are going to be explored in much more detail in tomorrow and Thursday's webinar. So if you want a closer look at some of them, it's well worth uh, tuning into them. But certainly they are there. And I, I would suggest you take a wee bit of your own personal time at some point to just go in and have a little play about with them and see... Uh, if there's any of them that you think could be could be useful for you. But I do want to thank you for giving up your time on this uh, Tuesday morning and I, I hope you have a, a good week. And I'm going to hand back, hopefully, to Laura 
um, to finish us off for today.